Sorry, uh, I'm here, but I'm not here here yet, if you know what I mean. Just fixing stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah, OBS uh, on open, it did something really, really strange with the screen. And in the 40 minutes I was fiddling with it, I, uh, I thought I fixed it. Um, but then when I was about to go live, it canceled the video. Uh, it, I think it went live for like all of a second and then said video is canceled. Yay. Um, so, you know, tech stuff, you know, someday I'll win a million dollars and I'll hire assistants who actually know what they're doing to, uh, to make these type of mess ups not be my responsibility. If something screws up and go, well, Joe did it. I'm not going to fire Joe. Joe's a nice guy, but Joe, don't make this mistake again. All right. So on screen right now, um, uh, I'm starting promotion for an upcoming, uh, Zoop campaign to do a collection of all the witch drawings I've done. Uh, it's it's just witch drawings. It's going to be a beautiful little black and white book. Um, we already got a whole bunch of signups, but we need a lot more people to sign up to make it a really successful book at launch. Um, it's going to be all last year's Witchtober pieces, all the Witchy Wednesdays, and all this year's Witchtober pieces. And possibly if, if with some stretch goals, there might be room for additional artwork. There might be some chances for you to tell me what kind of witch you want me to draw. So it'd be a very limited number of those. And a lot of the original art will be available um, uh, as additional rewards for back uh, when you back the book. So yeah, so all you do is you go to this URL, see how you print it all out. So and it's on it's on decent paper, so I can just pull it out every week while we're while we're building up for this. And just enter your email, get notified. We don't have a firm day yet on launch. It's very likely going to run simultaneous uh, with Witchtober, but uh, we don't have an official date yet. So if you want to get notified so you can get in there, get the early bird specials, because we are going to do some early bird pricing, a bunch of things, get your email in there and you'll be notified on launch. And in the interim, I'm drawing all these smaller little like um, busts of, of my witches, not as nearly as lavative as the Witch Wednesdays or Witchtober pieces, and they'll be available too. I mean, if you want, if my regular larger pieces are too expensive, these will be available at a greatly reduced price. And then we're doing things like remarks and signed books and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, so uh, before I get diving into Elric, uh, I wanted to get this out of the way and probably I might bring it up again at the end of the session, just you know, in case someone came in late. Um, and you're going to be seeing this this card around for a bit. I know apparently you can do title cards that actually show up on screen in uh, OBS, but 
guys, I just spent 40 minutes trying to figure out why my screen was too small. So uh, let's please, please put up with me doing, doing the signage for a bit. All right. So this week, um, I need to be drawing one of my favorite fantasy characters of all time, Elric and Melda Boney. Um, originally created by Michael Moorcock back in the 60s. Um, it was one of the turning point fantasy characters um, in fantasy fiction. Uh, essentially, Elric is not a nice person. He's a, a prince of a, a very decadent, very evil empire. And what makes him uh, a sympathetic protagonist is he suffers a lot uh, through all the things that he goes through and invariably and chooses the side of, of what's best uh, while he's a pawn in the wars between the, uh, uh, the gods of chaos and the lords of order. And um, Michael Moorcock has written a vast, hang on, I just have it right here. Um, I, I bought initially the Michael Whalen books and then um, the, I believe it was Robert Gould who did these amazing watercolor and pencil drawings for covers. But recently, like within the last two years, after uh, Michael Moorcock had decided that he wanted to go over the entirety of the Elric saga, because so many of them were written as short stories, go over them, clean up um, some of the continuity area areas, areas, um, redo some of the writing and everything, just make sure everything tied together, redid the order. And now uh, there's these wonderful, beautiful hardcover collections. Now, I believe this, this volume, I started rereading it um, because the commission. Um, I, uh, this, I believe, has what would constitute the original four paperbacks of, of the Elfric stuff. And it's a three-part series, I believe. And it's got this lovely new Brahm cover um, with the sword. And it's got a beautiful map of the Young Kingdoms. It's got a couple of uncredited. I'm going to be a little pissy on this. It's got a couple of uncredited John uh, Picasso. I believe that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, drawings that were for some other editions I, I, I missed out on. I saw them well after they came out and sold out. Otherwise, I would have bought them. Um, so this, this lovely, uh, I believe it's pencil or graphite could be charcoal. It's dark enough, but on, on this type of paper, you wouldn't get those values, those values. And there's another one here at the back. Do, 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 do. See if I can find it. So they got two really beautiful, beautiful drawings by John Picasso. Um, he does beautiful paintings as well. But they don't they don't credit him anywhere. I, I looked. If if it's credited, I haven't found it yet. They have like credit for um, graphic designers, Brahms cover art, who printed it, and then they have a full color insert section, just four pages on gloss paper. So one of the Robert Gould uh, um, artwork pieces. I don't believe this is the first cover. I think this is the second one. Um, this is the part from another cover. I think this is a. When, uh, one of the Lord of the Ring artists, John Howe, or um, oh god, I'm blanking name on. I, I think this is a John Howe painting. I think I could be wrong, um, but again, no credit. And then here we have a painting by an artist. I think I recognize the work. Um, god, I almost want to say Ned Dameron, but I don't think it's him. Um, and with some like chaos gods here in the background, with some like devastated uh, crenellations and a couple of humans hiding out in the smoke here. But yeah, and so they have these pieces, no credit to the uh, the artist, which is always going to piss off an artist. There's no artist who goes, oh, you didn't credit the artist? Oh, that's fine. Unless they're, you know, jerks. Uh, I try not to be a jerk. But anyway, some of the best fantasy ever written. Um, I, th I think I think if you love Neil Gaiman, you'll love, you'll love more. If you love Neil Gaiman or Alan Moore, you'll love Moorcock. Uh, if you like Grant Morrison, you probably still love Moorcock because, you know, Moorcock likes to run around saying that Grant Morrison ripped off everything he has from him. Um, feel free to disagree. Um, I like when people dump on Grant. I don't know why. Um, but, yeah, so uh, get this if, you, if you're curious. So on. Now, I spent – I usually spend – when I'm running in the stream, I spent a chunk of the morning – 
and amongst other things, figuring out how I'm going to draw it, doing the penciling, because I think people just want to see me dive into uh, the inking, because that shows up better on the screen than graphite. But over the last month or so, I've had, I think, six results, six results, six messages from people saying they would like to see the whole process. And knowing that this, this is going to be a big 11 by 17 piece, this might end up being a, actually, I'm pretty sure at this point, this is probably going to be a two-part session where I, I figure out, finalize the composition, I, I show you how we work with the figure, uh, how we get with, uh, I can do several figures when I'm drawing this. So you're going to see the whole process. So I'm going to go about an hour and a half, hopefully not much longer because I think, you know, attention spans shrink. But I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to do the pencils tonight. Definitely do the pencils. And I might, and if I, if I make amazing progress, I'm really happy with, with what I'm drawing. Uh, I'll print it onto board and I'll start inking it. But I'm thinking very likely I'll fin finish or get close to finishing the pencils tonight. And then next week I have a session of just inking the uh, 11 by 17 Elric piece. Um, I, I think um, I, I, let me see here. See if he's here. Oh, you hear? Uh, which, which, which for us? Yeah. Hey, much, uh, Mitchell. Uh, hi, Arzai. Um yeah, um, it's it's going to be too complicated piece. For example, um, I got up, I slept in a bit because I had an all-nighter. And the first thing I decided to do is I wanted to finalize how I'm going to draw Stormbringer. So I, I spent a big chunk of the time looking at different Stormbringer designs. I decided I liked Michael Whalen's initial uh, design quite a bit. But on looking for higher res Whalen swords, I found a replica that Moorcock uh, approved, I think, believe it's from Raven Armory. I don't know if it's available anymore. Uh, and looking at that sword, I liked it. Um, it had the same kind of almost diamond shape of the blade. Uh, it wasn't long enough. Um, in my rereading the research, I want to make sure I didn't screw anything up. Elric is over six feet tall. Everyone thinks of him like this waifish, uh, anemic, um, almost like boy looking character. I've seen characters that make him look so effeminate and so small, it, it doesn't make sense. Stormbringer is approximately five feet, probably four and a half to five feet long from um, pommel to tip. And, and of course, so Elric has to wear it over his back, but um, Elric is still taller than his sword. And he's tall and there's been some uh, some bits in the stories over the years where they, they had like tall female partners for him. And they were, you know, 5'10", 5'11", and Elric was still taller. So I, I'm, I'm going to be going into this assuming Elric is over six feet tall and then matching Stormbringer to roughly that height. So changing the blade and everything. And, and um, the swords are cool. Should I put, you know what I'm going to do while I'm blabbing about this? I'm just going to put this on camera so you actually have something cool to look at. So this court, sword is very cool. You, you find out over the course of reading it, that it wasn't forged by man. It is actually a part of a, a group of demons who take the shape of these black swords. Now, Stormbringer is one of the only, I believe this later stories might, might prove me wrong. I haven't read the latest stuff, the stuff that's come out in the last decade. Um, Stormbringer has a name, uh, has its name. It has a twin blade that was introduced early on called Mornblade. Uh, almost identical in every single way. And Elric's cousin wielded Mornblade at one point, or two points, actually. Um, so um, so he's actually wielding a demon in sword form. And the demon, of course, is supernatural. And just cutting someone, it kills them. And the sword itself can cut through anything except for the most powerful, magically protected things. So it's 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 Excalibur gone to nightmare levels. So Elric kills someone with the sword just by just no, no armor can protect you against it in the super magical armor. Uh, it cuts you. It automatically kills you. It feasts on your soul, so you no longer exist in any supernatural level once once you've been killed by Stormbringer and Elric. It, who is also a powerful sorcerer in addition to being uh, the, the last prince of the Empire of Melnabone, um, also can sacrifice the people he's about to kill to get more power from his patron god, uh, Arioch. Um, 
Oh, that's a that's a lot lot of info dump. I hope you I hope you don't mind doing the info dump, but I want you guys to be a little invested in this. Um, I'm not going to spoil what happens with the sword later on, but um, the idea is is that this he's cursed. Elric is cursed because he was born uh, an albino, but not just that. He's got an incredibly weak physicality to him, low energy. Um, there's clearly something wrong with him of, of above and beyond uh, being an albino. Because I've, I've met plenty of albinos who are perfectly healthy. I've met a couple of albino bodybuilders in my life. But so the al albinism, I believe that's how you say it, is just a symptom of, of that there's something deeply wrong with Elric. And at the start of the series, he's using potions and spells to give him the physical vigor he needs to, you know, enter combat and stuff. But once he's essentially bonded with Stormbringer, um, Stormbringer gives him that power. And the more Elric fights with Stormbringer, the more powerful he becomes. It's, it's, it's this terrible thing. And on top of that, what makes it worse is Stormbringer is intrinsically evil, even though Elric isn't. Um, and Stormbringer during those moments of bloodlust can drive Elric to do not good things. Um, people who shouldn't die die because Elric's wielding Stormbringer, even though you need Elric with Stormbringer to fight the ultimate war between law and, law and chaos. Speaking of chaos, has a very cool symbol, uh, it's an eight pointed circle, um, or a circle with eight arrows pointing away from it. Now, I wanted to introduce that. Um, in fact, hang on a second. Do I have that sketch from last week? Can I get over there without pulling my mic out? Nope. Hang on. Oh, there it is. So last week, while working on the Batman painting, um, the person who actually commissioned this Elric piece um, brought up Stormbringer. And so I just did a really, really, really quick test and like what I do, I was entirely thinking about like the type of effect that would demonstrate that um, Stormbringers feeding on souls. So I came with the idea of like, you know, smoky energy coming off of this black blade. None, none of the runes are drawn in there. You're, I'm going to show you, I did a design for Stormbringer, but like just suggest skulls. So I know how I'm going to do this in pen and ink. Uh, and I knew I wanted to put that eight pointed circle. Generally, it's, it's more like this. Yeah. yeah. Right. You have arrows going out and eight points. And they're usually like just almost like uh, signage arrows. I'm doing this really quickly. Uh, that's why it's so sloppy, not because I can't draw better. That's my excuse. I'm sticking with it. Okay, so this is like, and I've seen so many amazing visuals of it. And I was, I, I so I had that initially here in the pommel uh, and I dropped a jewel in it because I remember there was a jewel in it. That jewel apparently is up here, actually. So I prop, that's that's where I'm going to put it. I did, I did my research. Um, and I wasn't quite sure how to do the Quillens. Um, uh, a lot of artists have very famously just done like almost these like spider legs crossing with the sword coming up through it, right? Variations of that. Um, some of them, um, th there's the idea of like the Quillens are thrusting forward. It seems much more aggressive. And it's, and, and Stormberger is designed, described as a very large sword. I don't think Moorcock gave a shit about uh, actual swordsmanship or the, the details. They just saw like a giant black blade. Um, and then considering that the average sword would be less than three feet in length, um, the fact that it's almost five feet, four and a half to five feet is a big sword. It's not like Braveheart William Wallace big, but it's, it's a big sword, especially for some like uh, super thin scrawny albino. Uh, so I was looking at all those designs. And, um, so like I said, I, pr I probably spent far too much time designing the sword based on a whole bunch of stuff. And I ended up, yeah, here's, here's a photo. I printed out of the replica sword that from, I think it's Raven Armory. I'm going to write it here. In case someone wants to look for it and see if they're still uh, making or selling them. It looks cool. It looks a little stumpy. I'm not in love with the Quillens, but it looks really good. And I like the runes on it. I like the mirrored runes here. 
so using this as an, ins an inspiration, um, just drawing a Photoshop so I could actually use the line tool to draw things much faster. Uh, I designed my own. Everything's going to go flying now as I dig out the sword. I designed my own Stormbringer, and it's way too big, but it's generating my own reference. So, so this is the Stormbringer I designed. Um, it still has the diamond shape that Michael Whalen first initially put on there. I liked some of the uh, the I wouldn't know what you would call this here. I like some of that. But I didn't really like the quillins because I initially was going to do those spidery quillins from uh, the Wayland piece. But I figured out a different way to get the um, eight pointed chaos symbol there in the hilt because I mean, with with the spider things, you'd have those things coming up. Whereas here is I got I got an arrow here going up the blade. Um, the pommel is another arrow, so I got those arrows coming up, and the quillins are this nice, complicated, almost circular shape with arrows coming out in different angles. And since this sword's pretty much indestructible, all of these points can catch blades coming in in terms of a parry and break maneuver. There's sword breakers were a common thing with heavier blades because they could they could trap the blade would come down. So a blade would strike this, slide down. If it get caught in anything, the the wielder could twist it. And by twisting the metal at a really sharp, hard angle, with two pieces of metal, there's a very good chance they could shatter the blade, and which is essentially disarming the, the opponent. Yeah, so that's what I came up with in terms of the pommel design. And uh, I'm a big fan of Blambot. And ages ago, I, I got a font from him called Lovecraft's Diary. And what I was initially doing is I was... I was looking at these and I really thought these were good. And they're pretty close to... Uh, what Whalen and some of the other artists had done. And so I was trying to trace them off and some of the shapes just weren't feeling right. And I felt there would be, they were too fragile for the size, ultimate size that the sword's going to be. I wanted something a little bolder. So what I did is I, I came up with, I, this is just Stormbringer right in here. Um, and a blade of fate and then Alpha Omega's characters, I just thought. So there's a, a mirrored set of runes here. It's Stormbringer twice, a uh, different version to saying, you know, final blade and everything, Alpha Omega there. So these will be glowing red. I'm gonna be painting red on these runes in the final image. Uh, so this, this is almost a reverse thing. This should actually be, everything here is black. There's gonna be that one jewel there. I might put another one here in the pommel, if you can see it. Um, uh, I think, Part of what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to have this um, have like a different texture so that the arrow coming up from, from the hilt and pommel will actually read better. Uh, and then solid black blade with the red glowing out of it. And that's going to be in the midst of all that smoke of the souls being fed into Stormbringer and then into Elric. So that's my sword design. Let me see here. Uh, let's see here. Mel de Bonet. Here we go. Mel de Bonet. Well, you know, considering more cock, it probably does go both ways. Uh, and I'm happy you like the hilt. So, and what I also did is, so it, it took a couple hours to get happy with that. Um, I, I'm not going to show the ones I threw away because they're really, one of them is so der derivative. I was, I was so excited drawing it. And then I looked at my whale in reference and went, oh my God, it's the exact same sword. I don't want I don't want to feel like obligated in that way. <clears throat> so I also did a bunch of initial thumbnails. Um, I don't see where I put them. I do a lot of little thumbnails like, um, here, I'll draw. I got all this paper, I'll use it. So when I'm, when I'm coming up with images, I'll do 12 to 15. Oh, you know what? They're in the other room. I'm not going to go get them. So I do a little th thumbnails. I, there's a, a system called dy dynamic symmetry, which is better than the rule of thirds. It allows you to break up the space a lot more. So I kind of fake uh, dynamic symmetry in it and um, and it gives me all these different lines to to construct stuff and uh, and I'll just think okay how am I going to break up that space I know I want Elric holding a sword uh, I want him to be in the focal point so it's automatically going to be smaller piece so that because that means 
while you're focusing on this, this it's it's so easy. I could like just fill the page with Elric, but I want there to be drama and narrative around that. So I'm going to be using this uh, extra space around Elric, and you'll see me working on it shortly to decide. I, I still haven't decided. Is it, I, I think it's going to be an interior thing. I'm going to uh, like uh, imply like some sort of like opening to the outdoors here. Um, subdivide that one there and have that come up there. So the sword's coming out through there. So Elric could be against the sky. It's going to be an interior, maybe inside Mildebone. Uh, there's a big fight, um, a bunch of fights where Elric goes to the Dreaming City, Ymir, um, and has to fight fellow Melibonians and his cousin. So uh, I, if the swords feast, there's going to be bodies. So I'm thinking it's like a battle scene just inside some sort of large chamber, uh, allowed open out to the open air. So I can actually have like dark patterns here, dark patterns here, shadows coming in, dead bodies going to the shadows. And with the outdoor, outdoor light, backlighting Elric, even though it's going to be four light coming in so we can see details, this will really, really pop. And so I went from there. This is about, I don't know, the 15th or 16th thumbnail I did. And so I came up with this. I blew up. I have a, a dynamic symmetry file in my computer, so I immediately can pull it up and have all the lines there when I just start drawing. Uh, and I was starting to draw it in the computer, and I realized if I go any further, it's going to be fully penciled. So I just printed this as, as the starting point. And I'm going to talk through the decisions, um, what I'm doing. Right, right now, he looks stumpy. I don't like this gesture, so I'm going to be doing a bunch of gestures. I could, I could even, during the session, say, okay, I'm happy with this. Take the smaller pencil drawing, blow it up, print it up really big, and then do all the armor design and everything in a really big figure. And, um, and when I'm happy with that, I can scan it again, clean it up a bit, and then make that assemble that towards the final piece I'll ink next week. So this is part of how I'm working. You see some fundamental little bits of anatomy going here. It's like I wasn't quite sure where this leg's going to go. I just know that I want the foot planted here. Um, and I want this like going here. I like the arm coming down on this line here, but I might change that. I could do that with a cape. Uh, there was lots of capes in uh, the Elric art, even though, you know, incredible say no capes. Uh, this is a great term, terms of going across a, a line in the background for like the floor of this chamber to end that, that line that's established in the uh, dynamic symmetry good works. Uh, using this line, which is essentially one third to have Stormbringer launch off and then have all the souls and everything. And to make them almost more like, you know, um, fading off, going off into here. Um, so th these lines help me decide how these shapes are going to fill up. Um, we're going to be, I think, the implication, one of the things I have to fiddle around with is, the implication is from just how loosely sketches is, is, is our eye level is, higher like our horizon lines actually up here whereas i really want i want to drop everything down here a bit right i want to be around you know elric's waist maybe even mid thigh like a cowboy shot and that'll change the perspective of the figure so i have to sort that out uh if i do that the chamber is either really huge with the floor edge to the outside being up there or i might end up moving it right here which means we'll see less of the interior and more of um, how high the walls are and all the decorative elements, but also means that we can do something cool. Like I can, uh, with this much sky, uh, there, could, there could be dragons flying around, you know, um, that'd be right in the smoke. So it's, it's things I got to consider. I don't want anything to take away from the composition, but uh, I mean, I could, I could even end up going like, you know, two hands on the, on the hilt to really establish how big the hilt is. Arc is back in have his foot come back here and have his, his foot still thrusting forward and try and get a sense of the physicality of, like, you can't see the pencil lines in there, but get a sense of the pencil, uh, physicality of how much power Stormbringer has that Elric needs two hands to hold it when it's feeding like this. And then I can just like, you know, uh, draw overlapping dead bodies. Um, yeah. Okay. So I need to lower that. I'm thinking out loud as I'm talking here. Now, um, I've talked about my favorite drawing paper, and that is bond paper. Um, but I'm going to talk about it again because people need to know about this. Stuff. All right. So I started working on this kind of paper in college. 
Borden Riley, number 37, Boris Marker layout, bright white, translucent, visual bond. And it's great. It has a little bit of two, so it takes pencil great. I can smudge all I want. It erases really easily. But the reason I love this paper more than any other paper out there, because there are other papers that have just great tooth and they can take all sorts of abuse, but this paper is so thin. I mean, it's like you draw on it, you might as well throw it away right away. But it's translucent. Look at that. I can, all the information, everything I've sketched already is still there, readily visible for me to work with. Um, so this is, this is why I like working on this paper so much. And uh, I will probably continue to work on it either as long as they're making it or as long as I'm drawing, because this is, this is so much a part of my process. I mean, a couple of the earlier Stormbringer sketches were drawn in that when I was just literally taking, I Oh, oh God, I bundled them up in the garbage. I'm not going to pull them out. So what I what I do is I just take a really, really thick, uh, even thicker, like this is a 0.7 pencil. Um, I'll take, uh, this wasn't what I used, but it wouldn't sit your pencil and, and draw everything with the side and then carve in darker lines where I want it. So I get a general shape and then I can, you know, push and play with it. And I can use a kneaded eraser to lighten it or a regular eraser to uh, pull out those highlights. So, so here we are. I want to, I want to figure out this figure more than the background. The background, once I have this figure, because I might end up drawing him like a dozen times tonight. Um, uh, uh, if, you, if you know Eric Canetti, and I don't know if he's still streaming, but for the longest time he was on, on, um, on Twitch and he was streaming and he would, watching him work would be great because he, he'd start drawing a figure and it looks like it's going fine. And you can just hear in the tone of his voice when he's talking, you know, answering questions. So you go, it's not going fine. And it became a kind of a game to go, okay, when's he going to just stop and start again? Um, and, uh, and part of it is, is I know that so well. I have, I have finished, I've literally finished inking covers and realized there's a significant figure that needed to be redrawn and patching it just wouldn't work for me creatively. I, I want, I want a drawing to be a drawing all in one go. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, I got to work to figure this out. All right. So, yeah, you know, now the more I think about it, the more I want him in that I'm, I'm almost overwhelmed by the sword. And so I want his arms. One, one trick I learned is, um, yeah, what is put his right hand higher, just underneath the quillens. Give like a half inch on that. And it's essentially, since I designed a box, I can actually just do a box because the, the arrows come into that. That makes it easier. And that point there, that looks like my initial sketch up for the sword, that it's actually, yeah, it's about five feet. It's, it's coming towards the camera, so it's going to look a little bigger, which means the viewer can see it. Um, okay, so if he's right hand there, shoulder down there, get his nice long arms, because again, over six feet, he's, his proportions are going to be far more heroic. So right now I'm just sketching in a basic mannequin. Which I'll probably change a lot. I might end up immediately, as soon as I, if I'm happy with the proportions, uh, I'd throw another sheet of paper over top of it or slide it underneath and then do the figure tighter. Get all those, those proportions right. Or not. So. And Elric is scrawny. Athletic, but scrawny and supernaturally powered. So if he's got both arms up here, how do I want his legs? So he can have his, yeah, let's twist his hips a little bit. So we're going from there down to there. So 
So that leg, which is coming off a of camera there. Can I push this a little higher maybe? Oops, seeing a lamp. Do do. No, it doesn't look like I can actually zoom out as much as I think I would need, but I'm getting there. There we go. That seems like an okay, I'll, I'll, if I'm working on the figure more, I'm not going to do the sword, I'll just do the figure, but his feet are just off here. And this leg. So it's so almost like he's fighting it. And I probably want. No, I probably want more of like, he's getting pushed back. So let's push this a little bit forward. And probably lost you already there with some of that shape. Let me get my favorite new eraser, which should just be because so I was using it like crazy earlier today. The things I'm working on right now, so many cool things I can't talk about. It. Mm, yeah, this is all right, eraser. I'd rather use the Moo, it picks up better. So, already like having them almost like physically overpowered by the sword. If he's doing that, then his chin's going to drive down into his chest. Still want to have him have him have a neck. His chin's going to be driven down to his neck. And this is you know, putting both arms. This is where a cape comes in nicely because then I can like have that cape flutter and actually accentuates the dynamism. And I can even theoretically do Stormbringer in a bit of an angle. Because that diagonal would read better, I think. And if that goes to the diagonal, what happens? Everything's going to shift a little bit. Um, uh, so I'm going I'm to talk you through the entire thought process I have when I do this stuff. Um, so then, you know, it says, well, what were you thinking? Well, I said, well, you know, there's a whole video of me just thinking nonstop. Uh, is that reading as a uh, pose? I'll probably even... Might pull those even further, the shoulders for it. Like he's almost like pushing it away from himself. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is okay. So I'm going to have the cape coming down through there. I can use other uh, elements of the dynamics through there. That's probably going to end up moving him to about there, that line there. Well, if that moves the sword there, then I definitely want to tilt it. And then it'll still be fitting up there. Okay. Okay, can you guys see that basic gestural shape I got? That's what I'm going to use as, as the basis to develop a better Elric figure here. Now, the proportions aren't 100% right. If I'm moving down more... I think this leg has to come down more like that. And at this early stage of drawing, you're going to be doing a number of things as an artist. You're going to be thinking both about the 3D fundamentals of that mannequin in space, but you also are trying to think about that silhouette, like how the simple shape of the figure reads across to the audience. Um, so right now, this is this this proximity here is while it could work with the arms, I want his arms to be a little lankier because they'll actually make him look a little taller. Um, and I also kind of want to get the sense that the arm he's 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 almost combination barely able to hold on to the sword, and um, this and and also kind of trying to keep this incredible thing of evil away from him. There's some great drawings and paintings of, of Elric almost being like intimate, like holding his sword like a, like a child. Um, 
which is, is a great way to get across the relationship with the king between the characters. But in, in these moments, these battle moments where Stormbringer is essentially taking over uh, while essentially keeping Elric alive, that should have a more complex dynamic. So that's what I'm going to try and get across here. Um, uh, so, yeah, so I think I got the basics for that. I've, I've shifted away from what I initially, like just holding the sword one handed almost like holding up, presenting it, whereas now he's he's fighting to control of the sword. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my basic layout, put it aside, because I'm just focusing on my figure now. And I'm going to sort out all the issues with the figure. Um, I also do this one thing where it makes it easier to slide the paper on the other and actually have it higher on screen. I just take a ruler, pull off that extra bit of paper. Not ruler, straight edge, sorry. And so when I slide it under and go up higher, and then the figure is, I think the figure is not fully in the paper. So what I'm going to do now, and I think that took me 10 minutes. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I am going to draw another version of the figure on this. I'm going to be playing around with the anatomy more, moving stuff around, um, getting these arms right. And I might get it. You know, oh, look how dirty my side of my hands are already getting. Um, I might get it all, all, all right sorted here. Uh, I may not. All I'm aiming to do is do a second drawing that gets closer to what I want. And then sometimes that means I do have to do a third drawing that gets me closer to where I want or a fourth or a fifth. It doesn't matter. You, if, if you want your work to, to be at the level that you need it to be, you, you just do it. You, you do it, man. It's what you do. So I'm I, I have my proportions generally here. So I'm going to start off by sketching in a mannequin. And his pelvis is slightly tilted. So it's gonna be now. If are we if we're at this level, okay, for that level, his rib cage opening there is gonna come down through there. So we're gonna see more of that part of the rib cage. The shoulder is going to be much higher than that shoulder, even though this is hip square tilted there. Okay, well, regardless, that part of the hip isn't going to be as low because of just the perspective of it. So I go see people. So I got a nice turn there. I got the femur coming down here. The other femur is coming down there. Again, we're not dealing with superhero anatomy at all. So what that means is I'm just dealing with uh, essentially realistic human proportions and even thinner because uh, Elric is so rail thin. Um, I might move that leg because that's starting to look a little stiff. After I get happy with the body, I, I have to, uh, maybe that leg should go there. Yeah, that's not reading right. All right, so we have scapular force. So both of his shoulders are coming forward. So elbow there. Let's put my higher. So this is actually going to be aiming lower. Really overlapping there. I don't like that. Especially since we're looking up front and either should we should. Okay, so 
there. So that's plenty straight. So I put that hand too high. As the shoulder is coming out here, bending down, then going up. So his hand's going to be coming like that. Hmm. Do I want to reverse the hands? If, if you if you can't tell what I'm talking about, there's from how I pose the figure, there's a, a serious overlap of the arms. Even dropping this arm down here, and this go up here. So I get that arm coming through there, which also gonna move his head down here a lot more. Um, get this arm up higher. Hmm. Nope, I have to do it the other way. I have to do it the other way around. Now, the other way around in this case is basically switching which hand's on top. If you're right-handed, I think your hand's going to be closer to the uh, the quillens. Uh, so your right hand would be up. But for the purpose of this pose, I'm going to put his, his right hand down. So that means... I'm going to put Elric's right hand there. And if the left hand is coming up higher, put the other hand right on top. And that means now this arm is, is essentially coming straight out from here and flexing back. So now I can see some space between both arms. And then Stormbringer is being held here. I want it over its head to start back here. Okay. Now, do I want him looking up at the blade or at the pommel? He's looking up at the blade, better, better to have his head looking up. Get that wonderful you know, white hair like just blowing back with this cape. Um, see, weird thing is that I'm liking that part of the body. I figured the feet, legs, the hips, everything moving up there is nice. Now I kind of feel I want to um, I want to rotate the body a little bit more towards the viewer. Um, it would feel that that kind of twist would be better. Uh, might means I have, might mean I have to completely figure out the hands again. Um, but now that I've got this mostly resolved, even though there's like a big shadow area kind of on a lot of the overlap I did here, we just light this lighten this down a bit. Um, and then that's coming right across there. Yeah, I think I'm going to keep the legs, but I'm going to rotate the upper body a bit. And I'll actually bring Stormbringer's incline a little bit closer to that initial vertical. So I'll still work with the composition I had. Um, yeah, so I'm going to do that. And what that means is we're now on to, as I, as I threatened, the next drawing. Normally, I work on smaller pads for, like, just smaller drawings. But this pad's on the table, and I'm already fumbling around with so many things as it is. Any questions here? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's actually something I learned in college. One of my first teachers uh, recommended these big 18 by 24 bond paper pads as the primary paper for the entire class for a whole semester. That's what all we drew on. We did our pencil roughs, then we did drawings and ink on them. And um, I kind of permanently got addicted to that paper. All right, so looking at this, 
I'm generally, when I say I'm happier with this, I'm, I'm, I'm happy-ish. Um, so if I'm going to be rotating him, these might change a bit as I get closer to it. Just because that, if he's rotating a bit, his pelvis will open up a bit. I'm going to put that there. Pubis is there. It's pushing. So this might go, yeah, this will go down lower. His feet are getting closer together because the, the horizon line is dropping here because I'm just being mindful of where I want to place the camera. So if this is twisting and being pushed back, so then the sternum is going to be along this line, I think. So we're going to twist. The rib cage is going to come like that. And it's going to open like that. And we got that. So then the bleaks coming down through there, going up. Which also push pulls this shoulder back. Right, his, his left shoulder back. Uh, and if I'm doing that, and if I keep the hands at the, at the I don't want to obscure Elric's face. face. Um, let me just get this arm happy here. So if uh, it's pushing forward, so that's roughly the length of the upper arm. Mm -hmm. Do a little block for a hand. I don't know, there's something else I could do. I could actually have, have it like look like he's, he's trying to engage his left arm in this too. So I can actually. We'll try that. Well, that's actually that's that's I think a more dynamic pose right there. Um, not sure, not sure I'm gonna keep with the arm there. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of different arm poses I can do there, but I think you know his chin, the way you kind of pull your chin in all the way when you're doing uh, bench presses, uh, having that uh, kind of like overwhelming effort to hold on to that sword works. Let's pull his elbow down there. He's going to have all sorts of ornate armor. The black armor is going to be fun to draw, um, especially since in, in the scale that we're working on here, I get to design general things that suggest lots of stuff. Um, I'm not going to give him the dragon helmet, though. I, I, I want that white hair blowing because I, I know I'm going to be doing some like value stuff, and I want the head to pop. So I'm going to do some dark shapes right around the hair. Um, Um, okay, so it's that. That looks like six foot three to you. Uh, I think it looks like it to me.
Yeah, so I think we're doing one-handed now. Sorry. Um, you have to, you have an idea, you really should. You owe your instincts as an artist. If you have an idea and you think it might work, you have to explore it, even if it doesn't work. The two arms thing didn't work stuff from this angle. Um, I, I can now think of radically different poses, radically different compositions that were that 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 pose would work. But I want the idea of Elric fighting Stormbringer a certain amount. So uh, having his head pushed back here. Um, I could actually throw a second weapon in his hand. The idea that, well, oh, nah, nah, that's too much. Um, just when you put weapons in a hand, it's, 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 um, it gives you another shape to point stuff compositionally. Uh, whereas if I have a hand, I have to be very conscious of like what I end up doing with like the fingers and the actual movement of the arm and how that relates. Whereas like as soon as I connect that arm with a weapon that has a strong uh, directional line of action in it, it points. It just points and then I can use it to like pull the composition together. Um, I know I'm going to do the cape, which is going to obfuscate some of the arm. It's going to do something like that. Uh, probably like a three quarter length cape. Uh, there's going to be boots. I'm going to think this is, um, he's not wearing the full dragon armor. I think he's going to be wearing like some, some Melnibonian uh design piece like the uh van braces maybe bare arms because so many wayland pieces are bare arms and maybe a bandolier and some leather over top of like some implied chain mail and then like some fancy boots i pull that over there mm. What I might also want to do to get across, I'm losing, there's a, there seems to be a, want, a bit of a want to do the line of action there. So, what I could do is I could pull that, even with the twist, I could literally pull it. So, it's, again, here we go. <laughs> Better for me to show than to try and tell. So, so now I'm getting close. I really feel I'm getting close. Uh, this is this is just how I work, which is part of the reason why I usually start my sessions with like the thing ready to ink because here I am being, yeah, I'm gonna do this. No, nope, I'm gonna do this. All right, so I'm going to verticalize, verticalize, uh, change the relation of, of the further back leg, the right leg to the torso, the idea that he's, that he's pushing against it, um, his pelvis there. So what I'm gonna do though, is now that I got that, I'm going to do this. And I'm gonna pull this, this part of his body in that direction. And he's really, really, he's just sort of right in there. So he's actually forcing his, it's more vertical, his head shape. So he got that. And this is again, uh, because I've drawn everything, I can actually start, moving things that are almost finished drawing elements. And um, I just have to trace them off and, and suddenly I have what I need for this, this piece. It's a, it, it seems like it's more work because I'm drawing again and again and again, but it will, uh, the head's lean, the head's like leaning, uh, towards me a bit here. I want that head to be 
pushing forward more. The head's actually too big already again, but uh, I can fix that quick enough. So we got the sword. It looks like it's kind of pulling him and pushing him back at the same point. I'm going to flare out his knee a bit more here. Maybe more of a cross shot, but you know, hey, why not? Um, spot. Outer vast is coming down. Leg. That Bissema curve in the shin always makes the lines more dynamic. Actually, he might be on the balls of his feet here too. Like he's like fighting both, both his feet are fighting uh, against the pressure. Like he's like he's being blown away. So his hair is going to be like cape of be writhing around. And if he's wearing black armor, what I can do is I can do like some serious foreshortening on this arm and have it come across. And then the hand gets uh, silhouetted. The white hand gets silhouetted against his chest. Um, that might be the best thing because then the white, the white, the white skin will pop against all the dark stuff. I'll be putting like all sorts of costume details on this. And actually holding the sword with one hand will make it, make the sword look bigger. Now you think I'm done there. No, what I what I normally do, and it's what I'm gonna do now, is now that I think I got this figure figured out, I'm gonna scan this and I'm gonna make it as big as possible to fit an 11 by 17, print it out, and then I'm gonna do a more detailed figure drawing on this. So blowing it up will save, like in the, in the 90s, I would have gone, like I would have had all these pages partially done like this. I would have run the Kinko's and I would have photographed, I'd have written notes like, okay, 140, 150, 160. And it gives me a range of, of sizes to play with. And I, um, but with the computer, I, I have the computer right here. I can scan right here. And um, it allows me to go a lot faster. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to scan this picture. And I should probably put something here just so you guys can look at something while I'm doing it. Here we go. There we go. Uh, I'm going to scan this drawing that I'm mostly happy with. Again, this is nowhere near 100%. I might make more changes when it's bigger too. But I'm going to scan this, uh, enlarge it so it fits on 11 by 17, print it on 11 by 17, and I'm not even going to draw on it. I'm going to stick it underneath the next blank paper, and then I'll draw it. So environmental, or mental, one of the two. Right now I'm using an, an Epson Workforce 7840. It's a great um, all-in-one. Has features I never use because I don't fax. Who faxes? Medical office fax, I guess. Um, but it's, it's much better scanning than my previous Epson uh, all-in-one. It's still not as good as photographing in terms of getting color quality. Um, but it's scanning for black and white or for just work process, stuff like this. It's perfect, and it's and it's printing is fast. Uh, that, it is slow scanning, actually, because uh, I scan everything at 600 dpi. I, I just literally, I scan everything at 600 dpi. Um, I was just, I was talking to the Zoop people, and they had a problem with a book um, the artist submitted 300 DPI files, and if you're, unless you're really, really on top of it and know what you're looking for, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between 300 DPI and 600 DPI. 
at just looking at thumbnails. Um, and as a result, the, the printed result was uh, a lot of the finest lines disappeared. And it was entirely because the artist scanned everything to or submitted everything in too low resolution. So my response to that, scan everything in high resolution and then downsize to what I need it to be. So even though this, this drawing will very likely, very is very unlikely to ever see print, I have a 600 DPI scan of, of this drawing. Okay. Image size. Um, let's see if we'll fill in 16. Yeah, if I do that to 10. My 16 to 4, that's pretty good. I'm going to drop it to 300 DPI. And I'm going to make it black and white. And then print. Okay. Um, sub 2, 11 by 17. Paper, plain paper. All right. And print. Hi, Brendan. Thanks for dropping in. I didn't think you'd make it tonight. Uh, yeah. All right. So that's that only took a couple minutes. Here it is. There's a much, much enlarged figure. And that will fit on. It'll mostly fit on. So um, the longer you're, you're, you're making art for a living, the more, hopefully, the more you're adopting a, a working process um, that uh, helps you avoid mistakes and everything. I'm going to crank this up a bit so we get all the upper part of the figure there. That works, that works. All right. I already got eight clients on my body. That's good enough. Um, so you can see I've blown up the figure huge uh, compared to the initial drawing. In fact, let me grab it. There we go. So now I can actually do real anatomical work on this figure. And it doesn't guarantee I'm, I'm done ripping paper. Um, but since I feel that this is the closest to the figure uh, to do what I want it to do, um, uh, I can I can figure out the anatomy here. Any other changes would be minor in comparison. Okay. All right. So again, I'm going to go deep into the anatomy. Um, the head placement will be a lot easier to figure out here uh, to get across what I want. Because um, I want is there's there's a way where you can like um, push the cervical vertebrae at the back of, uh, of your neck, push them so you're almost like trying to vertically slide all your vertebrae back. So your chin's almost in line with the pit of your collarbones. Um, and uh, that's what I'm gonna be going for with Elric here. Like he's fighting, he's, he's, he's literally dealing with this incredibly powerful uh, demonic force. Uh, and he's not even trying to stop it. It's just that that's how powerful Stormbringer is. That's 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 the impression I'm trying to get across here. Plus, I also want to get across the uh, the almost skeletal thinness that Elric has. So it's um, guy. Watch, I end up looking like one of the White Walkers. Not, I'm not going with that. Like a fine bone Aquilonian nose. So I think you can almost see, if you can see it, you can actually see some of like the, the expression I'm trying to get in here. I remember the first time I saw someone draw I'll work with pointy ears, and I'm going, ah, I'll work doesn't have pointy ears, my 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 brother. Um thinking he's an elf. He looked because he's albino. Everyone just assumed he's. I think a lot of people in fantasy just assumed Elric was an elf until they actually read read the books, if they read the books. Oh, who's, I'm getting a lot of notifications here. Here we go. Uh, 
Uh, oh, just a whole bunch of people uh, reacting to my post about the technical screw up. Well, that's nice. Thank you, people. So we got the clavicle here. His arm's going forward. So the clavicle is going to be going straight there. He's fighting with this one. It's going higher. So that's what we got there. I have that gap. The pectoral reach through there. Yeah, I, I work out the muscular anatomy, even though we're not going to see it. Uh, it, just, it just means I'm far more likely to get everything more accurate for made-up anatomy. I do this with my witches, too. So, uh, sometimes I have sketches uh, right on hand I've done from uh, life models or photos, photographs. And I, I, I sketch works full of that stuff. Or I actually have photo reference in front of me, and I'll just use that. It just makes it go so much faster. Um, what I could have done, and I considered it, is I have a couple of these uh, Fison figures. Hope you don't mind the digression, but I'm getting close to finishing the figures, so I figured I can do that. So I got I got this guy. I got a woman up over there, but I don't want to get up and pull her down. Uh, this guy's way too hefty. Um, I mean, proportionately, he's not the head's too big, of course. Uh, this is like a five foot ten guy, uh, based on this figure and that head size. Um, unless that you know, unless outsized heads like Josh Berlin has a giant head, so he always looks shorter than he really is. But I could have very easily forced that shoulder forward, put him in in that complete position. But then I wouldn't be able to get that neck because it doesn't compress the way human neck was. And so I, I could have posed him. Blah. But I look at a completely different body sh uh, shape. So I'd be changing stuff anyway, proportionally. Um, I'd be coming up with different reference points because he's not as thick as this Fison figure. So this guy's good for like, you know, Conan, regular superheroes, not good for Elric or, you know, children or, or the Hulk. Does have lat, so that's coming down through there. It's going to be some armor and some costuming up here. So that's going to obfuscate some of the details I'm, I'm coming up with here. Okay, so we got the clavicle. So we have the anterior head of the deltoid come up through there. And we have some of the medial head of the deltoid there. Comes up there to the and the humerus, that point, the joint in there, it's tricep, tricep. Again, Elric is very thin, very emaciated, so we're not going to see a lot of muscle. Uh, he's going to have that very thin man muscle type of thing happening. So enough to establish that there's muscle there, but not enough to actually give him any bulk. Now, after, this is going to be the last commission I'll be able to do for a Sunday night stream for a while. Um, I'm kind of happy that means I'm going to be spending two weeks on it because right after that, I'm going to spend the rest of the Sunday night streams before uh, Witchtober working on the cover. So you guys will see me actually drawing the cover for the Witchtober coven book um, that I'm, uh, or crowdfunding in, in uh not too soft. I, I'm not supposed to say any sort of thought date yet because we don't want to spoil it. Plus, we want everyone to sign up so they know um, they'll be notified on launch and they won't just take it for granted and forget. Uh, and a big part of that is that's why we do early bird 
I mean, it's part partly doing early, early bird specials gets people like the, the back it early and fast, which is, you know, good. But um, if you sign up, you get that chance to really take advantage of the early bird specials. This leg's too long. This thing's got to thing's got to be up here. Femur's here, so that's coming through there. Intervastus. It's just opening. We got the muscles inside the thigh. Um, that goes there. That goes there. Got that hamstring shown there. Completely useless information to have um, when you know you're going to do in costume, but it actually all that additional information uh, helps me uh, understand um, where I might be going wrong with the anatomy. So that's that's why I do all this stuff. Um, yeah, so the ankle's going to be up there. So everything everything's just moving up slightly in that. Um, might shrink this head a bit. It's gotten a little big, but I actually kind of like the features on it. So, um, yeah. that arm got too long. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a quick moment. I, I should be doing this more and more. So when I'm drawing an arm in the mannequin form, so you have collarbone, and behind it you have the scapula, and out of it you have the humerus, and then you have uh, the ulna and the radius coming down. And what I do is I draw a box, and what it is is they represent, rec represent the two bones that are connecting to there. And then at the end of the box is a little ball, because that's that's there's a whole bunch of little bones in here that allow us to do all that with our with our wrist but I, it's a bag of marbles to me when i talk about anatomy and then you have the box of that part of the palm in those fingers and then you know you have fingers coming off of it and you have the thumb coming off of it but i like to have that little box there so if, if they cross over so let's say we're we're we got the thumb here oh, visible good and um, let's say you rotate thumb out. Those bones seem to cross over. The thumb out there. So I like to have the humerus connected and I just have those two sticks. So if they crossed over, I'd have the bones um, crossing over there and it just represents two sticks. It's just, it's just almost like a mnemonic for me to remember how to do this. Okay, we're already at 824, which is, which is uh, not bad for in terms of how we normally work. I think I'm gonna go to nine. I'll make it a, like a two hour stream. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna work on this and then so you see how I do the figure and next week I will uh, do the bodies in the floor I'll, I'll finish the composition as I described it uh, and I'll have everything ready to ink next week uh, but I'm gonna keep working on this if I end up happy with the bits of anatomy I got here then I'm going to I'll probably literally pull this off throw it under another piece and then start drawing the armor and um, uh, costuming on top of uh, the figure. I'm going to ignore the arm possibly covering up here. So I want to get the anatomy around the rib cage correct. So we got that, flattens out, comes down here. So this is that coming down through there. Got the serrat eye. We got the obliques. Now I might tweak this because trying to draw them super thin, I'm, I might be distorting the rib cage a bit. But I want to get this sorted out. Naval junk. 
Uh, so this gives me his waist. A little indentation there. A little bit of back muscle. Slight concavity here under his arm. We have all the shoulder coming off here. Yeah. Jump back down here for a second. I just saw something I want to tweak with. Yeah, if he's posting there, he'd be double dimple there. There we go. I got I gotta give him like fancy, like weird costume. I mean, my first exposure to Elric, I think, was a preview in Epic Illustrated in Marvel Comics from Marvel Comics back in the very early 80s. I don't think I don't think Epic Illustrated started in in the, the 70s. I'm pretty sure it's, it was Marvel's response to heavy metal. Um, so it was it was a um, somewhat PG heavy metal. It did have sex and nudity in it, but nowhere near as much as heavy metal. Um, and uh, they had uh, Roy Thomas, uh, uh, Michael Gilbert, and Craig Russell collaborating to adapt Elric. And it was bizarre and weird and fabulous. And um, I was I was completely sold with just how stylized and brilliant it was. And uh, they followed it up with one of those official Marvel graphic novels where they adapted uh, The Dreaming City, which is one of the short stories. Um, Elric going back to Ymir um, to try and get his love back. Um, from his cousin, he's assumed rule of Ymir. Um, and then everything went to Pacific Comics, if I remember correctly. And went there for a few issues, and then Pacific went belly up. And I want to say First Comics or Kamiko picked it up. I think it was First Comics. Because um, First seemed to really, really pick up a lot. They picked up Nexus when um, Pacific went under business. Uh, and Badger, like you picked up a whole bunch of like really good books that just didn't, that were doing well, but not well enough to save the company that was uh, putting them out. Um, yeah, this torso might be a little long. The usual answer to that is to thicken it out a bit, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm probably either lay the page, page over again and just like shrink it a bit here and the head's a bit, or I might actually do that in Photoshop. Um, Actually, it looks like your arms are going behind his back here. Uh, so I can do a whole bunch of things with this arm. So like I said, I can have it like it's coming in, coming towards the viewer, like, like a cylinder, we draw a cylinder. So it's coming towards the viewer, and then it bends, and the arm is in front of the chest, and with the black clothing or whatever, his hand pops. Or, and there's something to be said for that, so seeing his hand. But his hand's not really doing anything other than hopefully having a gesture showing he's fighting. Um, when you have the figure overlap itself, you are very much interrupting with the silhouette it delivers. So the silhouette would be, if the hand comes over, the silhouette of the figure ends up being maybe with a tiny little window into the negative space back there. And that just becomes like, what happens with his arm? Because the silhouette, it just disappears. But if I drop it a bit, Drop the shoulder a bit. I can I can have it coming back, say about to there, and then let me get rid of the silhouette I start partially drew. Now let me get rid of the upper shoulder because his arm's not going up like that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I gotta shrink that head a bit. So if it's coming back here, it can be coming back. Shoulder, small tricep. And then I can like, uh, play with my hand gestures until I get like one that really feels like, you know, like, ah, palm coming back. 
So if his palm's coming forward, then the box goes like that. Thumb would come back like that. And I probably want the index coming down like that. Oh, I dug out a I dug out, found some uh, even more notes on my old hand drawing course from uh, Craftsy. So I'm not that far away from being able to actually sit down. I got a friend who uh, who wants to do some uh, editing and some some work to help me not have like issues with my camera <laughs> um, when I start it for streaming. Yeah, that arm's too long, but that's kind of like I don't know, maybe I can pull that figure like that. Yeah. Yeah, arm's too long, but yeah, I think that brings it in through here, and I can probably have it connected more with the cape when I have it coming back. All right, okay, so so what I do when I get a, a drawing at this level, normally when it's just me in the studio, uh, immediately scan it. I would probably make some of the proportional adjustments in Photoshop. And this is still so messy. This is not a finished drawing for me to ink. This is close, but not there. Because then there's also no costuming. All right. But right off the bat, I'm going, all right, so this arm is a little long. Like the forearm, this part here. I mean, this part is like if, if you stand up straight and have your arms hanging straight down your sides and then bend up one arm, you realize your wrist generally comes towards the top of your bicep on your arm uh, or the lower part of your deltoid. So that's the consistent. So this is the length of his arm. This is almost the same length. So I got I to shorten this. I'll probably remove about that much. It brings it in. Um, your, your humerus, your upper arm bone, generally falls at the bottom of your rib cage, maybe a little bit longer, depends on the thing. So that's not terribly off here on this arm, but you can see, I just, I just drew the forearm way too long. It's a habit. I've always, something I got to overcome, uh, but I've drawn the forearm too long again. Uh, I do like the gesture now, but this is also too long. So I got to shorten that. It's a habit. I, I got to get over it. Um, so yeah, so to make this rib cage better, I'd have to thicken it up and suddenly, Elwick's going to look a little bit more robust. Um, so this is also a little long. So this is how I critically go through my drawings as I go. Some people were masters and they just get it right. When they just throw it down, they have those proportions in their head completely locked down. I don't. I wish I did. Um, and what I'll probably do is I may enlarge just slightly the entire this area. After I make the adjustments, that I might just zoom it out a bit in Photoshop so the pecs match the rib cage a little bit more. So I'm not moving. I'm, I am making the shoulders wider, but I'm not really adding any mass to what what's already in proportion to that. Um, if if his uh, center of his ribs are there, or sorry, sternum runs there, the, the pecs are running through there. Yeah, that that would just be better. And I can shrink off a little bit of the lat when I do that. Yeah, so that's that's what I'm gonna do. Now, in terms of costuming, um, at, don't check the time now. 8.34, I wanna go like 25 minutes, talk a little bit more. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start thinking through the costuming without actually fixing these, these elements. So I'm gonna do these post video session. So what I can do is I can either take this full whole drawing, I'm not gonna trim it down at all, I'm just gonna throw it underneath. And I'm gonna start literally thinking about the armor and everything I'm gonna be putting on this figure. Um, so if, if we look at some of the more popular famous Elric paintings and drawings, um, it's, it's kind of almost typical fantasy stuff. I'm going to make this on here. Um, so we can give them trousers, we can give them breeks, which are shorts. Um, you can even give them a kilt. I don't think there's any, anything against that. I mean, it's, it's very Celtic fantasy inspired, um, 
elements in the Eternal war, Warrior cycle, very British. So anything from that island, I think, is fair game to bring as a design element into this. Um, I, I, I want to give them some sort of um, chain mail. I'm going to give them like a chain shirt. So I'll become kind of like the half sleeves here. And having it hang a little loose around his upper arms will actually make him look thinner. Okay, so we'll have chainmail. It will sit on his body. And then we're only going to see it because what I'm going to do is I'm going to have like a leather jerkin as a collar. So I can do some sort of like cool stitching or button up on the front of it or ties, laces, whatever. I'm not quite sure yet. Um, Cause you'll have just been in a fight. There's going to be battle damage to this leather jerkin. Um, um, a lot of times they give them like rel uh, remnants of uh, uh, Melnobonian armor. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably put like some sort of like shoulder pad that the jerkin's covering, covering up. And the shoulder pad will actually make his arms look smaller too because these nice thick bits of metal coming underneath. I'll do some patterning on them or something. Um, I can't remember what the little discs are. I used to, used to know the number for, in heavier medieval armor, they have like these little discs to protect the armpit. So if something errantly went into it, there'd be like cups with a spike in it. So they would catch the point of anything that could theoretically rip out of their, uh, their armpit, which would kill them immediately. Uh, a little bit of bare arm. But right, you gotta, you gotta protect them forearms, my friends. So, Presented to these bracers amazingly well. So I'll do these like fancy uh, bracers protecting and then the hand will come up a bit more. Um, I'll do fancy patterning on it. Nothing, I'm, I'm not a big fan of like things where uh, an errant sword blow would knock the helmet sideways and your, your character's blind or the armor is so spiky the sword gets in there it actually literally knocks you off because it grabs into something. Um, so I, I prefer smooth with embossing or something in terms of like design. Um, so we're going to see his neck because I want to see like the striations and everything as he's fighting it. And there'll be a chain mail underneath the jerkin. Probably heavy stitching on the side. Uh, belt. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking uh, two sessions uh, wrapping up uh, September with work on the cover is great. Cause that means the cover is ready there for launch. Um, and also like two sessions directly promoting the, uh, the Zoop campaign. Great um, from just that type of thing in terms of like wanting to have people support me. All right, so I'm going to do a couple. I, I think I'll, I want very key thing here. Um, Stormbringer can't be worn at the hip. It's too long. So he would wear it on his back. So he would have either uh, a strap coming across his torso or two straps and with some sort of uh, binding agent, clip, button, whatever. So that gives me two real nice visual design elements, like an X shape going right across his chest. And um, there's going to be a cape there. So what I can also do is I can actually um, show a scabbard. And if the scabbard comes down, uh, would it be, if he's wearing it over 
over his right shoulder. So I think in the stories it talks about when he has a sword, the palm will actually rise above his head. So if I do this and it's not breaking up the figure too much because I got the color coming through here, I can, I can uh, suggest that that's the top of it and then it comes across. And I can do atmospheric effects and allow the scabbard to disappear there so it doesn't interfere or I can make it more solid. Okay, so I know I'm going to have the scabbard coming back there. Probably going to do like little details in the costuming just to make it feel like. Something a prince would wear. Um, Um, so he's going to have a belt. Of course, he's going to have a belt. Um, but we got to make it, you know, fancier, man. Um, let's say he has underneath the belt. Let's go with some like Aerosmith stuff. He's got some sort of sash tied up there. So we have some flare of fabric there. Belt trailing off here. Um, you could be wearing a secondary belt with uh, a dagger. So we can actually put a dagger coming back here. We can like we can fill up really interesting things around his waist. That makes it look like he, he does this for a living, like he kills and fights things for a living, which is you know what he does. Especially if I go, everything is dark. It, it allows me to create visual interest, uh, even if I make everything really, really dark, because I just move the patterns of the textures in a whole bunch of different ways. And um, it still reads as dark, but it reads with all the visual information inside it. Um, still not entirely 100% sure on pants or shorts or some sort of like kilt. You know, I'm gonna put a pin in that aspect of it. I'm just gonna put some other stuff on. I'm gonna put like a pouch here on his belt, put like some other item here. He had sorcerer's components and stuff too. So I'm gonna just have other stuff hanging off his belt. Maybe, you know, it's really cool. Um, he's gonna have a necklace. I can give him like a, a necklace with some stones and stuff. So that's swinging around, give him two. Uh, I can do like a, a loop of beads. I think it's something I stole from Barry Windsor Smith when he was drawing Rune. He'd do these like weird strings of beads just hanging off a character because they created visual interest. Um, good, good reason to do that. Um, I could also do the Frazetta thing where you actually have like a boot that actually adds knee armor. Um, see, if I give him shorts, I'm revealing the white skin again, which is also good. Um, Oh, you know what I can actually do? Hang on. Big baggy pants. I'm probably going to change my mind from that after. But I can strap top of his boots. Have like a little bit of flare hanging off him. Yeah, I'm probably not going to do the baggy pants. I'd much rather like turn those into shorts, like nice big Lucy 
loose Lucy loose breaks and then show his legs and then have like his knees wrapped up yeah oh my god that's that's an idea he has his knees wrapped up for protection and uh little bits of fabric hanging off of it so it becomes almost like a fashion choice like like something whenever i do an L elric i'm kind of like hey, what, what would Bo bowie do bowie would like just do so much so many amazing things you know if it's there so yeah so i can do knee wraps short uh shorts stuff hanging in it. i can do like a nice pattern in these shorts these breeks Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think that might be the costume I'm going to give him. I'm um, having the time to to reflect on it before I assemble it for next uh, Sunday, and also having a better sense of the costume once I actually know exactly what I'm going to do with the background is really really good. Um, okay, yeah. So at this point, I'd scan the figure. I'd fix fix those uh, proportion elements there. Um, I would probably, once I do that, I would, because I have to redraw it anyway, I would, with the fixed figure, redraw these costume elements now that I know generally what I'm doing onto him. I decide like, uh, what type of, um, uh, textures I'm giving here. I'm thinking it's like, you do a chainmail shirt. I could do a dragon scale shirt too. Um, where it's an idea that maybe dragon scales have been sewn in, either into leather um, or on top of, or woven into chainmail for even more protection. Um, and I could actually like, just have like one dragon scale here and then all these smaller pieces. Oh, I like that idea, dragon scales. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do now. So I'm gonna do just one lamellar plate and a whole bunch of dragon sails. And then some of them are like swinging off that so it creates some like visual area. it doesn't make sense but it's going to look cool as fuck um i think i might put like an arm brace like uh, some piece of jewelry on his arm underneath that sleeve um something similar there you know i could put tight leather trousers and the whole mad mardigan type thing um and then i could do like the stitching like i'm doing on, on up there and then just have like another bit of like he has like multiple scars tied around his waist um because fashion and then that would justify the knees and then the nice thick leather boots like the uh i think of them like howard chicken boots the way howard chicken will draw boots it's like you have cowboy boots this no it's not shuffling the camera let me move this a bit all right, so you have your cowboy boots. And they're designed to uh, come off if you get thrown from your horse, All right? So you have that nice, uh, I'm trying to remember how they connect. There's a strip going in the back, there's that. I know there's that, so maybe it sews there. It's more of a pocket, so. Uh, cowboy boot, you can walk in it, but it won't hold your foot in it. So let's say you're thrown from a horse, um, your foot just comes out. And so a lot of like uh, fancy leather military boots have that. So well, that, that, but it's like that whole point where it just goes straight down the back of the, the line of the heel. So there's extra space for the ankle. Just a look I like. And then there's like a nice little dent here because it's softer. So there's a dent there. And you usually square, squared off at the top. Uh, maybe with like a one tag at the back to pull them on. And then they're usually pointier. And of course, glossy black. Yeah, so I think I want to give Elric those kind of boots. But then I'll, I'll do some sort of like fancy uh, line work or something on it to make it uh, more cosmetic. Um, I, th I think this is a good point to stop this. Um, I mean, back half of fashion. There we go. Plenty of love, soul center, right? <laughs> well, the Bowie, I love it. Good jobs. Um, well, yeah, because he's a dragon rider. I figured they'd have dragon riding boots. Um, don't think he, Elric used spurs. 
I already control so many things through uh, force of will. I have this gut feeling that uh, if Elor got any normal horse, he'd be able to almost like mentally command it to do what he wants to do. Um, not out of telepathy, but just out of his like inherent sorcerousness. This. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do the proportional fixes. I'm gonna finalize the costume, finalize the environment, and it's really easy for me to draw a bunch of dead bodies. And I'll probably with this extra time, I'll actually probably make them all more elaborate. So the guy commissioning it gets a, a more polished piece, which is always better. Uh, so this is actually jumping up to cover quality. Um, and then I'm gonna do some environmental architectural stuff in the background. Uh, which I can then degrade and splatter with blood and stuff because there was a fight there. And then I'm going to show some of the environment, probably because probably Emir is an island and it looks out in the ocean. So if we see any of the landscape other than just me just opening up for a nice white space to do the sword effects, um, there'll probably be some boats. Um, all right. Um, as, as I'm now, I guess I'm now I'm starting to wind down. Um, let me put this up. There we go. Um, any questions before I wrap up tonight? Because, uh, yeah, so if, you, if, if you're if you at all interested in the 100-page uh, collection of all my witch drawings, Witchy Wednesdays, Witchtober, uh, go to this URL. You'll see this page. It'll have different pieces. Right, I put this piece right in there. Uh, just put your email in your address in, and they will send you an email upon launch. And I believe the early bird specials um, is it the first day or the first twelve hours? I cannot recall. I should ask. Um, but yeah, so if you can sign up on that, you'll be notified. Um, uh, there's going to be lots of lots of rewards. Um, signed trade paperbacks of other work I've done. Um, um, alternative covers for other other people's books uh some of them really recent some of them from like really hard to get uh so they're going to be available as rewards uh i think it depends if i think it's either it, we, we talked about so many things um i think we're going to have like uh up to five um draw me a specific witch for you but that's only if we had a stretch goal to add pages um, so you would actually commission me for a witch that will appear in the book. Uh, so that's above, above and beyond the hundred witches and any other back matter we want to throw in there. Cause I've drawn a lot of witches that I didn't publish. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, if there's no questions, uh, we're now about quarter to, oh, we're actually almost at nine. So just falling short of nine here. All right. So, um, 7 p.m. next next Sunday, I will be inking the piece, and I should be able to ink the whole piece because all the hard stuff, the hardest part of the penciling is done tonight. Um, the rest of the hard stuff will be done at some point during the week, uh, and then next Sunday, starting at seven, assuming no OBS issues, I'm going to dive right into inking this Elric piece, and you'll see I'll be using some rubber stamps, some splatter, some special effects, and the commissioner wanted red paint for the runes on Stormbringer. So I will be either using a red paint pen or um, starting off by putting red marker because the black will cover the red uh, and then just having to be careful around that maybe a little bit of red paint on top of that to give an impression that's glowing. That's it. So uh, hopefully you all are, are happy with the video tonight. Please like and subscribe. Um, eventually, once upon a time, um, I thought that followers would just aggregate everywhere in social media, but I realized it's hard work. You have to ask people to subscribe because, you know, they're probably already thinking, well, I'll check it out already when I want to. But if you subscribe, it has it benefits to me directly in the long term. Uh, I believe, I believe the number is I hit a thousand subscribers and 4,000 watch hours, I can monetize this channel, which means you can, you're, you're, I, I, hopefully you're watching this without ads, but um, it means that for people who are watching ads, you can feel a little bit better about it because that might throw some money my way. And so I go, you know, die lonely, broken, alone and starving. Uh, no guilt. Um, everyone have an amazing week. 
And I will see you all next Sunday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.